welcome. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I, I've been living most of the last 25 years in New York, actually, um, where I was a journalist, mainly with the New York Times. And then they used to keep sending me to Asia to write stories about psychiatry and science because that was my, that was my uh, brief with them. And I was always coming through Bangkok, actually, in order to go to other places in China or Borneo or wherever it was. And I suppose over time, I came to love Bangkok, and I don't really know why. It was just one of those things, some cities grab you in that way. Anyway, I settled down in Bangkok, and in the beginning, I didn't have residency there, so I had to leave every 30 days to get my um, visa renewed. So I would take the plane, and I would look at all the cities around Bangkok and say which was the closest ones. And I would go to Phnom Penh and Singapore and so on. But then I got to liking to go to Macau. And I would take the uh, weekend gambling plane from Bangkok. But Macau is very popular with Thai gamblers because th uh, gambling is illegal in Thailand. Everything else is legal but not gambling. You can't gamble. So I would go to Macau with all these ancient Thai gamblers you know, smoking on the plane and everything. And I thought, uh, this is a very peculiar little part of the Asian makeup here. And uh, so different from Hong Kong. You know, the, I, I knew Hong Kong because I'd been here with my parents years before, and I, I knew Hong Kong quite well, as a lot of British people do. But uh, Macau was Portuguese, so it was a completely different world and much more mysterious to me. Um, but you know, going there many, many times over the years, but never living there. I, there was never an old hand in Macau, you know, but going there quite regularly, I began to become more and more interested in the way this little world worked. And, um, and then I saw the Johnny Toe film, uh, Exiled, which some of you may know. Johnny Toe being the great Hong Kong director, who's produced the greatest gangster films in Hong Kong cinema. But his films are also very complex and very subtle, and very interesting. Um, and he also made another film called Vengeance with Johnny Halliday, which is also partially set in Macau. We saw looking at the city through the eyes of Hong Kong directors was also uh, sort of an enticement to me. And eventually I began to think, why should they not set a story there? Vengeance is an interesting film. I don't know if any of you know it, um, but it's quite a popular film in Hong Kong. And it's about a French guy who comes to Macau in order to avenge the killing of his daughter by local mobsters. But this idea of the foreigner, the white man, the lone white man who was in Macau was quite interesting to me. All the time I spent in Macau, I would always feel I was the only guaylo there. I mean, I don't know why that is. You'd think there'd be lots of gamblers there. But no, they're all, they're all Chinese. So I often felt in Bangkok, I, there's lots of white people. You know, there's 100,000 white people there. It's a huge community. And I'd go to Macau, and I'd be the only white person there. And I rather like that feeling. And so I think the idea of my hero, Lord Doyle, the so-called Lord Doyle, was born, which was sort of based on myself in a way, um, but not myself, but loosely based on myself. And I began to think that maybe there was an idea of a story who was of somebody who was lost in a city he didn't really understand, and he would never go back home. Um, but anyway, I'm going to read the first chapter of it, which mostly for you is very short. It's only three pages. But it sort of sets the scene of the casino world and everything. I should stress that it's not a gambling book. It's not. Um, I get all these hideous reviews on Amazon in America with these guys like, oh, there's nothing about gambling in this book and there's no tips about how to win a gambling. I was disgusted. I threw it across the room. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I think, like, okay, John from Houston, Texas, we can have a cup of tea and talk about that if you want. But I'm not writing a book about gambling. I'm, you know, it's just that's the background, but actually it's a very different kind of story but we'll talk about that in a minute. So, without further ado, I do, and I have my glasses down. At midnight on Mondays, or a little after, I arrive at the Greek mythology in Taipa, where I play on those nights when I have nowhere else to go, when I am tired of Fernando's and the Club Militar and the little brothel hotels in Republica. I like it because there are no Chinese TV stars and because they know me by sight. It is one of the older casinos, archaic and run down. Its woodwork reeks of smoke and its carpets have a sweet, rancid sponginess that my English shows like. I go there every other weekend night or so, losing a thousand a week from my inexhaustible fund. I go there to scatter my wan, my dollars, my kwai, 
And losing there is easier than winning, more gratifying. It's more like winning than winning itself. And everyone knows that you are not a real player until you secretly prefer losing. I like the bars stocked with Great Wall and Dragon Seal wine, which you can mix with Dr. Pepper. I like the Greeks themselves, Zeus at the top of the gold staircase and the freezers of centaurs. I like the receptionist in cherry hats who will sleep with you if you pay them enough. I even like the deserted traffic circle at the end of the street where I can go to catch my breath during a losing streak. The air in Macau is always sharp and clean somehow, except when it's foul and humid. We are surrounded by stormy seas. The crowd is mainlander at New Year, an outpouring of the nearby cities of Guangzhou and Shenzhen and their choking suburbs. They look like crows, like swarms of birds. I wonder what they make of the murals of the happy nymphs. Among them, one can spot the safety pin millionaires, the managers of the Pearl River factories, the family-run manufacturing units specializing in computer keyboard buttons and toy cogs and gears for lawnmowers, all here to blow their hard-earned wads of, on the I Ching. The doors are of that bright gold that the Chinese love, the carpet that deep red that they also love and that is said to be the color of luck. Droplet chandeliers plunge from ceilings painted with scenes from Tiepolo, with the zephyrs given Asian canthi. Corridor flowing into corridor, an endless system of corridors, like every Macau ma casino. I pass into a vestibule, red vases where the glass screens are frosted with images of Confucius and naked girls. In a private room, previously, pre briefly glimpsed, two Chinese players are laying down Hong Kong $100 bets every minute, but with a show of macho lethargy and indifference. One of them smokes an enormous cigar from the open box of complimentary Havanas on the table, flicking the ash into a metal conch shell intended to echo the cheap reproductions of Botticelli cut into the blue walls. My hands begin to sweat beneath the gloves I always wear inside the gaming houses. The smell that curls into my nose is that of humans concentrating on their bad luck, perspiring like me because of the broken fans. The game here is Punto Blanco Baccarat, it involves no skill, and that is why the Chinese like it. Each table has a vertical electronic board upon which the patterns of luck are displayed as mathematical trends in columns of numerals. The crowds gather around these boards to decide which tables are lucky and which are not. They scrutinize the lines of numbers, which change minutely with every hand that is played on the table. It's a way of computing the winds of change, the patterns of luck, and I dare say the Western eye cannot read them at all, but then they are not intended for our eyes. I sit and take out my crocodile wallet. I play in yellow kid gloves and everyone there thinks I am a lord of some kind, a lord on the run with an unlucky streak that can be mitigated by the forces of the I Ching. The waiter asks me if I would like another drink, a bottle of champagne perhaps. I order a bottle of something or other and I think I'll drink it all anyway, sooner or later, I always do. I never seem to get drunk either way. There is a middle-aged woman at the table and no one else. She looks over her spectacles towards me and there is the usual xenophobic hatred in her eye and yet she is coquettish. She is a pro at the tables. She is dolled up in clothes from the malls in Sim Sha Shui. She is playing with a mixture of mainland kwai and Hong Kong dollars with a few tourist tokens thrown in. Easy picking, she is thinking, looking at this plump guaylo in his gloves and bow tie with his look of a New England literature professor out on the town without permission from his wife. She looks me over and I enjoy the thought of skinning her alive with a few good hands. This encourages me to settle in. The bets are $50 a hand. I begin to smoke, as I always do. Red Pagoda Hill and Zonggan Ha, the stuff that kills. The dealer gives me a little look. He too recognizes me. They are only a handful of Guaylo players in the whole city. The wind, he says kindly, is blowing the wrong way tonight. Bail out? But I think, the bitch is making money. She's sucking my money out of me. No, no, keep at it, I say. Sure, sure. I double my bets. I put down $100 bills on the three car players and watch them disappear to the other side of the table. 150, the woman says in Mandarin, tossing a green chip into the middle of an even greener table. 200, I say in Cantonese. 250, 350. All right, she sighs. We play for four hands and I lose three. A plate of bacalao appears on the table and the woman picks up a plastic fork with undisguised relish. The I Ching is with her. I see now how much gold she is wearing. I get up unsteadily and decide to backtrack to the men's room and cool off. The dealer hesitates and says, 
Sir? But I wave him down. I'll be back, I say. I never give up on the night until I am ready to fall down. I walk off as if it doesn't matter to me at all, as if I really will come back down from the men's room and skin her alive, and I am sure I will. Good, thank you. Um, now, L Lord Doyle, your gambler, is not really a lord at all, is he? No, he's a, he's a corrupt lawyer. Uh, no, he, of course, he's a fraud, he's a lawyer. Um, and of a type I've noticed in many places in Asia, um, where you have these British or Australian guys who've lived their whole lives as, you know, lawyers or bureaucrats or, you know, insurance salesmen, and they decide to reinvent themselves. But they can do that in these big cities because nobody knows who they are. And he's not trying very hard to win either, is he? Well, I think the secret of gambling is to like losing. If you don't like losing, you're not a gambler. And the people who I've noticed who play very powerfully, or very intensely, they get a thrill out of losing, not out of winning. Like winning is, you know, of course you expect to win, you want to win. But you're the, the real gambler likes to lose just as much as he likes to win. And you always lose, because everybody loses in the casinos. I once did a, a journalistic story about Macau for the New Yorker magazine in New York, and they sent me to Macau, this is in 2008, completely unrelated, and they said, uh, why don't you go there and um, we'll give you $2,000 and see if you can win something. And so I went there with my $2,000 free dollars from the New Yorker magazine, and I lost it in about two days. And then I had to interview uh, the guys who run the casinos, the Steve Wynn people from Vegas. And I said, this is incredible, I came here with $2,000 and I didn't win anything. And, I, and, I, you know, and they're like, it's a game of pure luck, there's no skill involved, so how come I lost? And they all laughed and like, you always lose. You can't, there's no way that anybody can win. Why do you think we're multimillionaires and you're not? <laughs> so, yeah, it's like you, you have to lose. But losing is what it's all about. Nobody wins in the casinos. Nobody. And there's, there's a woman in the book too. Yeah. Well, this book really was a ghost story. I wanted to write it as a ghost story. Um, and the why? Well, because in the West, we don't have ghost stories anymore. We have, uh, our ghost movies are not very convincing because we don't believe in it anymore. But I've noticed in Asia that people do believe in ghosts and that ghosts are very real. I live in Bangkok. Uh, everybody I know in Bangkok uh, believes in P, in ghosts. Uh, my house is surrounded by spirit houses. At night, when I look out, I can see all these little spirit houses with the candles. And this is where the dead live, you know. So it's very real, it's very everybody believes. Even the most educated, Western educated person in Thailand believes in the supernatural, believes in ghosts. I think the Chinese are the same, I'm not sure. I think they are. Um, so in Asia, and Japan is like that too, modern technocratic society, everything, you know, science, technology, but still ghosts. And so the, the idea that the supernatural is very close and not far away, is very intriguing to me, because I don't believe in ghosts, and yet now I'm beginning to believe in them more, <laughs> because I'm surrounded by people who think that way. And in Macau, you have a whole gambling industry which is also based on the supernatural. So I wanted to tap into the Chinese idea of ghosts. So I thought I would make a ghost a character in the book, although it's not clear at the beginning, but you see at the end. Yeah. So that's the story of my ghost. What was interesting is that, um, you know, I picked up on this immediately, but it was something that reviewers from English and, and, and American papers didn't really seem to, to pick up on. No, really. because they're, they're almost, um, they feel very awkward with that so whole subject matter, because it's a, it's a, it's a very um, debased and despised genre in the West. If you write a ghost story, it's ridiculous. Nobody would take it seriously. You know, and if you look at um, if you look at Japanese horror movies, uh, which are incredibly sophisticated and incredibly powerful, uh, or Korean or Chinese uh, ghosts, but Japanese and Koreans mainly, those are not horror in our sense. I mean, we, horror for us is Stephen King and Chainsaw Massacre. It's just nonsense. You know, it's just, it's not it's not at a very high level. Uh, the ghost stories being told in in Asian media are very profound and very sophisticated and very beautiful. Think of Ugetsu, the greatest film by Mizuguchi, uh, which is a ghost story, and it's an amazing film. One of the most beautiful films ever made. You know? 
but the West doesn't really doesn't really doesn't really understand that. It's a whole way of telling stories that we've abandoned, you know. And yet, you know, well, we, we used to have them in the nineteenth century, you know. Um, we just we don't we don't have them now. Um, so reviewers looking at the books looked at it as a kind of, you know, a sort of noirish, thrillery sort of, you know, uh, that sort of book. Uh, the ghost story was sort of strangely absent from the, the, the reviews and the uh, retelling. It's very interesting. And, you know, again, reviews on Amazon were like, uh, I was told there was a ghost story here, but I couldn't find it. You know, so you get that sort of comment. And you sort of think, I, you know, I couldn't make it more obvious if I try it, but there's, they just don't want to see it, you know. Or they think ghosts are sort of... Uh, you know, sort of uh, oh, guys dripping with blood, walking around with meat cleavers, you know. Uh, whereas I wanted something more subtle, whether you don't, the woman is just a woman, normal woman. Uh, you don't know she's a ghost. Uh, there's no ghostly things happening. It's just integrated into the normal story. It's integrated into real life. And that's why uh, there, there was not. Uh, it's not really clear until the, until the end. No, but I think there's a cultural divide there as well. I think the West is, uh, has a different um, mentality about these things and doesn't really, you know, they, they just didn't see it. Or they ignored it or, so, or did, didn't know how to, to Make react it, to it or something. If you, if you published a literary novel that is being reviewed by important newspapers and important media and so on, uh, they don't want to make, they think that's sort of like pop culture or something, it's trashy pop culture. Um, it's, I think that's the reason. But I, I guess you know. So what was interesting is that f from here you read this, you know immediately where the influence. If you're, comes if, you're if you're Chinese, if you're Asian, yeah, of course, it's immediate from the first page. Yeah, right. But um, the the other thing about the the book that I noticed when I was reading it is is that it's um, very exact. To the ex to in what sense? Well, in that it's very clear exactly where you've been. I think place is a very... There's a map almost in it. Isn't I think uh, one of the things I don't like about contemporary novels is they very rarely have a sense of place that is very developed, it's particularly in the English-speaking novel. I mean, most British novels don't, ha don't have that feeling of visceral place, that, put, that you've lived in the place, you know it very well. Um, even when they're writing about the UK, there's this kind of vagueness. It's, it's a strange lack of specificity. Whereas I think that fiction stories need to be embedded in places because places produce the story. Place produces character and it produces, therefore, story. Your place is the most important thing to get right. You have to, if you don't get that right, the rest isn't convincing. Um, I, one of the writers I was saying earlier that I love is Paul Bowles, and in Bowles' books about Morocco, you have this sense of place that is uh, not the result of a quick visit. I mean, it's somebody who's actually looked at that and felt that place very deeply. Um, but even if, it was, even if I was writing a story set in Basingstoke or something in England, I would still go to Basingstoke and I would look at it very, very carefully. You know. Uh, I've just written a book about Cambodia, a novel about Cambodia, and I was just fact-checking the book uh, last week. I was there for like two weeks, taking, just going to every single place in the book and making sure that I remembered it correctly, taking photographs, taking notes, making sure that even the names on the shops are correct. You know. And it was amazing because I wrote the draft of that book. It's called Hunters in the Dark, but I, you know, I, was, I wrote that book uh, based on memories and other notes I'd taken. And I thought it was exactly right. I thought every detail was correct. And I went back there two weeks ago, and it's all wrong. Everything was wrong. Amazing. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked and terrified. And I was like, you know, I got all kinds of spatial geographic things that were not quite right. If you describe a character going from one block to another block, or from one shop to another shop, or a hotel to another place, you have to time it. You have to do the walk yourself. So in the book, it takes five minutes. It has to take five minutes. But if you're writing from memory, it can take 15. It's wrong. <laughs> you have to go back and do the walk and make sure it's correct. I, I pulled out Google Maps as I was reading the book. <laughs> it's damn great. Because I wanted to say, I mean, because it was these. And? I didn't go to Macau. I haven't been to Macau in a long time, you know. And what did that, you find? I don't want to well, hear I this. I found out that, you know, places really were. When people turned the corner and found the shop, yeah, that's exactly where the shop was. I think when the character is moving through space, uh, and he, you say the character got to the corner of this street, and there was a jeweler's with such and such a name, and he turned right and went down the street, and there was a cafe with the guys. You know, that you should know what that you should know what that looks like. You should be, you should do that walk. I mean, without being pedantic, I 
some writers like to do huge amounts of research so that they then plop like clotted cream on top of their book. I'm not like that. I'm not, I don't believe, I'm not sure I really believe in that way of writing novels because I think the research becomes too extraneous and too third party. I mean, it's obvious that the person has spent six months in a library researching this and that just to, pad, to put it into the novel. Personally, I don't like to work that way. But we're talking here about actual places which are much more animal and much more, so they're an integral part of the story. And the way your characters move through space and time is your story, so it has to be, has to be correct. I'm not sure I have everything correct here. I mean, one shouldn't go crazy. I mean, you get some things wrong, and you get lots of things wrong. It's, it's not that, not that you, know, you don't have to worry about it too much. But um, Macau certainly has a very complicated geography. It's not that easy to get to. I also went back to Macau in December, having written this book, and was horrified to realize that it was all wrong. You know? <laughs> so I, go, I go around, the, I go around my book, like I, go, I had a draft, you know, proofs, and I turn the corner and realize, shit, it's not there. I, I misremembered it. It's the next block down, and you, your mind plays those tricks on you. You have got to get it right. So I spent I spent two weeks with a little. My girlfriend was going crazy. She's like, what are you doing? You're taking photographs of completely non you know non important things, but they were important to me because that what the character sees at a given moment. If you do that, if you root that in the place, then your story can be as fantastical as you want. It doesn't matter. It's rooted. You can it, it can be anything. It can be now. This is a ghost story, so it's already fantastical and improbable. Therefore. The places have to be correct. How do you how do you choose which details to include? I mean, for those of us that live here, we read the book and we can kind of walk with you as you as, as the character goes through this. But for someone that hasn't been here, of course, they're not doing that. So how do you that's decide a good, what? That's to a quite an interesting question, actually. I think that because for me, uh, I can't speak for any other other people, but for me, uh, books come out of places, not the other way around. I don't have an idea that I then find a place to fill in. I start with the place. I live in the place, I'm around it, I'm intrigued by it in some emotional way or something. So I already know, I already have ideas about places, about things that are like in the places. And in a very physical, uh, visual way, it's completely non-literary, non-intellectual. It's just, you know, uh, hanging out in a place for a long time, you begin to notice certain things. And it's weird, I don't know what, it's not a rational uh, process in any way, it's a very irrational and mysterious thing. But there's an emotion that comes from the place, I think. And then the characters tend then emerge. But we're talking about years and years of just thinking about it and not doing anything. I don't think I have, I don't, I've never had a plan where I, you know, I get a contract from it and then go off and write about somewhere. I, I couldn't do that. And that means that I, you, I only have a, a few books that I can do because there isn't enough time to, you know. <laughs> you know. I'm going to... Uh open it up for questions in a minute, but before I do, um, I've, I just finished your first novel. Which was only novel. published last year. I've only been a novelist for 18 months, so <laughs> be gentle. So there's hope for the rest of us, you see. Um, not something you need to start when you're in your teens. But they're similar, the protagonists are similar in a way. They're, neither of them are terribly nice people. I don't really, I can't stand it when people, again, I go back to the dreaded Amazon reviews where people say, I don't like any of these people. And I, I don't know what to say to that, really. I feel like saying, uh, God, you should meet me. You know, I, mean, put, I put the nicest side of myself on these people. If you don't like them, my God, you're in trouble. But I'm not really, I mean, are you, is Macbeth full of nice people? Is Hamlet full of nice people? I mean, it's <laughs> absurd. You know? what, what are nice people? And why would you want to write stories about them anyway? Um, I think m my books are sort of crime books in a way. I mean, they're dealing, that's the sort of the you know, it's not really a genre. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not trying to write crime thrillers, but I mean, I am dealing with that kind of story. So you're dealing with desperate people who are, you know, uh, who are ruled by fatalistic realities that they can't change. Uh, that reflects my own personal beliefs. I'm a pessimistic fatalist about all, all kinds of things, particularly about human nature. And I don't think... Uh, so the books that I... The novels... That I, I just started writing novels. I mean, I only started last year. So it's quite new for me in a way, in a weird sort of way. Um, but it's to explore the idea of fate, to explore the idea of uh, karma, to explore the idea of inevitability in human affairs. Um, and so... There's no room in that to dwell on people's niceness. It doesn't really enter into, 
you know, it doesn't enter into the calculation. I, I start with a story. Uh, the story is very important to me. It, it's not important for a lot of writers. For most writers actually don't write stories in novels that well, I don't think, unless they're actual commercial novelists. But in a literary novel, it's very looked down on. If you say you write stories in a literary novel, people sort of like, they think it's just not serious. No, I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, the story itself is a profound paradigm. It's a very profound thing to sell. You should consider very carefully what your story is trying to say. The story is saying something. It's not just a little, you know, it's not just a little Hollywood invention. Not at all. Um, especially when you're exploring things like this. But as to the question, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, people, do I regard people as nice or bad? No, I don't, I don't regard people that way. I don't think people are nice or not nice. I don't think that's, we're not like that. We're a mixture of, you know. And all of us will behave in horrifying ways, given half a chance. I mean, it's not. The women are nicer than the men in general. Well, they are in general, I mean. <laughs> Uh, Thank God. <laughs> but, but both of the books also... Not always, though. Not always. Both of the books are, are, if you like, people out, out of their element. They're people that have gone somewhere foreign, if you like. Uh, yeah, in The Forgiven, this book is about uh, people who go to a, week, a weekend party in a, a restored uh, palace in the desert in Morocco. But they're very much people I've hung out with. So, I, you know, these are not uh, exotic creations. I, mean, I always base characters on people I know and people I've been around for a long time so I can get their speech patterns correct and I can understand where they come from, what their social context is. And this is British and American people that I know very well. But I, the fact is, I think people live like this now. I don't think it's, um, you know, I think the world is quite a small place now. I don't think... These these things would have been exotic 30 years ago, but now they're not. They're really not. People do. People. I know people in London who go for weekends to Marrakesh. You know, they wouldn't think about it. You know. it's, not, it's just like going to Surrey. You know. So I think that's, that's the world we're living in now is very very tightly knit. You know. So I have some more questions to ask, but but why don't we um, see if there are any from from the audience, and we'll keep on going. No gambling questions. I think we have a mic for you, Mike, coming here. Uh, you said you, um, you said in story writing, the place is the most important thing, correct? Mm. Yeah. Um, in 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 the in the art of story writing, what what else do you consider important? Um, well, maybe one or two things. Yeah, it's a, again, you know, Evelyn Moore used to say. Uh, that you didn't you didn't have to describe anything. You just had to have your characters move through space and time. Supreme economy, which nobody can do. Most novels are over described. They're too long. There's too much too much words going on. It's not it doesn't work in that media. I think. Um, think of a novel like A Handful of Dust, which is one of the great one of the most brilliant, technically one of the most brilliant English novels. There's almost no description of anything. It's just ching, ching, ching. you have characters moving, talking. That's all. Um, it works extraordinarily well. It's not the only way to write a novel, obviously, you know. But it's it's to me it appeals to me personally. And the other thing is not to let your characters uh, necessarily wander off. Ian Forster used to have a wonderful uh, uh, rule. That he would say he would say I used, to, I used to I line my characters up on a starting line, and I say, look here, no larks. You just do you know just behave yourselves. So your characters will will sort of follow through. They won't just. Uh, and I also I think that's very appealing. But it depends what kind of novel you're writing. If you're writing a great digressionary, sprawling novel with blah blah blah, you know that's not going to work. But for me, um, I'm trying. My I think the novels I'm doing are quite short, and they're telling a particular kind of story. So it's very important to have momentum and motion and. Uh, which is not to say that descriptions, um, descriptions are also actually important, but it depends on what they have to be. They have to be there for a reason. You know. Both of the the novels take place in relatively short periods of time. Yeah, the forgiven, really. the forgiven. I, I count my chronologies very carefully. Uh, again, I think Aristotle was right. There should be unities. I mean, if you abandon Aristotle's idea of unities, then you're you're in you're on thin ice, actually. Even though most contemporary literature is like that.
but I think most of it is on thin ice. I mean, Aristotle said, unity of time. Think about that. Don't forget that. He's right. If you're reading a story and the unity of time falls apart, you don't know where you are. So you, you're the kind of reader who doesn't care. Well, I care about that. So in The Forgiven, which takes place over three days, but I had to calculate the story hour by hour. I had to write it out on a storyboard. I mean, hour by hour. It, this is what happens in this hour, but it's with three different places with different people. So the, it had to be click, click, click. It had to be done like that. But it mustn't seem like a clockwork fabrication. It mustn't seem like a sort of just, you know, going through the numbers. No, that's very important not to have that. So you have to work that out beforehand and then write it in one go, viscerally, so you get the unity of tone. And the Battle of the Small Player takes place again over a few days. I haven't tried, but then I'm a, I'm a novice novelist. I'm not really, I'm, I'm just learning how to do it. I'm not really experienced enough, basically, to do longer. So maybe in the future, I'll do longer periods of time. These multi-generational novels, I can't stand them. I can't bring them. <laughs> I just really can't, I just no interest in it. I, you know, a family worked over eight generations. Get lost. <laughs> not interested. Give me the concentrated, focused thriller that's much more interesting, much more humanly intense, and much more difficult to do. It took me 20 years to write that book to get it right. Because that, that book I wrote many, many times, it was, it's always bad for that reason. And I finally uh, got an editor in New York who said, you know, really, you need to just um, go back and read your Aristotle. And if you, you know, there's three unities, unity of place, unity of time. So think about that and do it more uh, rigorously. You know, really, really cut out everything that's not necessary. And then if you're going to, uh, you know, muse and meditate and, and have a little digression, then do it economically and when it's really necessary. Obviously, you're going to have characters who are going to sit on the doorstep looking up at the sky and thinking things. But it doesn't have to be 10 pages. You know, it's amazing what you can put in four lines. You say what you need to be said. And it could still be quite dreamy. You know? But I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of economy. I think, yes, this idea of uh, the novels don't have to be, you know, you can make your lines count line by line. Any other questions? You mentioned storyboarding. I'd be curious to hear what is your outlining process when you write your novel? And how much do you outline? I don't, I think it's good not to have an outline that goes right to the end, because I think that as you're writing, you should probably have that open door where you actually don't know what's going to happen. Because if you don't know what's going to happen, you're interested to find out what happens, and that keeps you propelled forward. I think there must be a kind of weird deadness about knowing exactly what's going to happen, because then you do go feel like you're going through the motions. And you've got to, that's the, that's the, down, the downside of this way of going about things, is that you've got this by the numbers risk. You want to avoid that. And, text has to be alive, you know. So keep that door open at the end where you don't know. Um, Battle of the Small Player, I didn't know, had no idea what the ending was. So what I thought, halfway through working out that story, I thought, okay, let's just start, let's roll. And then by the time we get to the next last 30 pages, something will, endless meditations in a hot bath will come up with something, you know. And invariably it does, because I think that's the way the human mind works. Once you're involved in doing something, the solutions, to that are kind of implicit in what you're doing, but you have to start doing it to find it. If you sit around waiting for the, the, the final cementing block in your structure, you might never find it if you don't start doing it. But at the same time, I don't think I want to, as Joyce said, just start writing, it doesn't matter. No, I don't think so, no. I think you need to have, I need to have some idea because stories are intricate, they're not easy to do. Literary people like to sneer at stories because they can't do them. They're much harder than writing just literary prose, I, I think. Literary, writing literary prose in itself is not that difficult, frankly. You know. uh, writing intricate and delicate story, extremely difficult, extremely difficult. I don't look down on commercial writers who do, uh, I don't look down on them at all. They may not be very good writers, but they're very good storytellers, and uh, that's a formidable skill. It's not something to be looked down at, you know. And uh, you know the fact that they sell millions of books may be a proof of that. Many of them are not very good writers, unfortunately. But why do we have to sort of have one or the other? I mean, it seems a shame that, uh, like Ian McEwan is a writer who thinks about his stories very. I'm sure if you know Ian McEwan was here and you were asking him, he would really tell you that I really work very hard on that. 
because it's not easy to do. You know, you work at it very, very carefully, and you work out because your story is saying something. And he's one writer who actually succeeds in doing that. You know. is it r related to that a little bit, um, the rhythm in Ballad of a Small Player changes. You know, it'll it'll go very, very fast for a while, and then it'll slow down. The that was on purpose. I think, I think again, one of the things what makes what makes stories. I'm not saying I'm, I, I've succeeded, by the way, because I don't think I'm that experienced at doing this. I mean, I don't know. I'm sort of just trying at it. I mean, I've read a, written a lot of failed novels. I've done it a few times. A lot of books that I never, you know, burned. You know, because I, I. But it was struggling to get this idea. What makes a story shift gears? You know, or it's. Um, Stories, rhythms of stories are difficult to get, you know, because the reader, if you read Homer, for example, read the, read the Odyssey, it's a classic story, and it's two and a half thousand years old, you can't go wrong. But you read the Homer, you read the Odyssey, just from the narrative point of view, it's exactly the same. You have long soliloquies by gods and, and then you have pieces of action, that just, you know, visceral, powerful, bloodthirsty action uh, for, you know, a hundred lines, and then it will go into another soliloquy. You get the changing, you know, that that so that suggests that stories can, must change gears. They can't be their tone must remain coherent, but they they can shift gears. And when they do, they're actually much more interesting. I was thinking like symphonies. You have well, I'm a classical mus I'm a classical musician oh, by training. So uh, I was a failed classical musician. Actually, embarrassingly enough, I was a, a lutenist. Uh, so that was my first career. <laughs> I was a bad lutenist and. I would give loot recitals to audiences much smaller than this. I mean, like three people or something. You know, half of them asleep. And I'd be playing my loot, you know. And I realized when I was 17 that I really didn't want to spend the rest of my life playing the loot to empty rooms. But doing classical music and classical piano as well, because my family are musicians. So doing classical music, um, I think all writers should do music because music is the great teacher of structure and form. It's that's what teaches you what structure is. Structure in music is exactly like narrative story. Exactly the same thing. Uh, imagine a symphony that has no structure. It's absurd. You can't. You couldn't. You couldn't do it. You couldn't even have a ten-minute piece of music that has no structure. Uh, even jazz, improvised jazz, has structure. You know? So it's in many ways the same thing. Yeah. And as a classical, if you do classical music, you internalize the idea of structure. It's just second nature. You shift mood. In a concerto or in a symphony, you shift mood from movement to movement, and this is what. But it all comes together. You know. I thank God I did. I did years of classical music. It was the best thing, uh, best thing I ever did in preparation for doing this. Any more questions from the floor? Hi. Uh, when you finish writing a book. We you have a sense of accomplishment, uh, relief, satisfaction, or will you have a sense of loss because you are no longer uh, living with the characters, you, know, you are no longer putting words into their mouth, you are no, no longer making them move, you are no longer steering their lives, or will you try to fill that emptiness with uh, uh, dashing off to another new novel? Uh, that's a very good question. I think. Um, yeah, all of those things. All of those things. Certainly, when a book's finished, I feel completely unemployed. I don't know what to do, really. Um, so I start. I, I start another one quite, uh, quite soon. It may not be something that works, but just to be doing something. I think you know, I write every day, a thousand words every day. So I'm always something doesn't matter. You know, I'll start another novel. It may be something that might not work now, but might work five years down the line or something. Um, but that's also, I think all human beings are like that, aren't they? They do one thing obsessively all the time when they're forced to stop doing it, and, you know, they don't know what to do. So yeah, I feel kind of orphaned when that happens. But I don't feel, as for uh, accomplishment and loss, I don't know. I think you know when something has reached its completion. And I think that's just a feeling that you've made something that ended and that it was finished. I think it's a very satisfying feeling. I would feel the same though, if I was making a table or a chair with my own hands, you know, that feeling of, I, I love doing carpentry. Have you ever done that? You make something yourself, and you make it, and you finish it. It's an amazing feeling that you've made something that can now stand by itself. I think that's a very uh, primeval human uh, feeling. Um, I 
Any uh, other questions? Of the two, the two towns in this book you write about, Hong Kong and Macau, they're portrayed quite differently, and his interaction with them are, are different as they're well. They're very different places. Yeah. I mean, Hong Kong, I know, uh, I know them both in different ways. Hong Kong, Anglophone, Macau, Portuguese, they have different relationships to the mainland, politically, uh, economically. Um, they're different people. I mean, the, the uh, the Macanese are you know are actually just different are different uh, they're the same of course but subtly different as well. Um, Hong Kong I'm English so Hong Kong to me is a different thing you know I mean I feel Hong Kong has double decker buses it has you know Watson's pharmacies it has you know it has all this English stuff so it's but Macau doesn't have that so Macau uh, really feels very very therefore I'm in a way I feel. The, more comfortable in Macau because it's more foreign. Do you see what I mean? Hong Kong is sort of more normal in a way for me, uh, in some mysterious way. I'm not quite sure why. But also, I've been, I was coming to Hong Kong when I was younger, so not Macau. So you know, uh, Hong Kong is more familiar in that way. My parents liked it very much here. So, so why include both cities in in the one? Book? Well, because uh, they are connected, and I wanted to write a book about money. I mean, money is a great subject and a great character in this book. It's a book about money, about our attitudes towards money, how money is made, and so on. And so it would seem a bit of a waste not to include Hong Kong as one of the great finance centers of the world and, the great, and, a, and a city which money is enormously imminent everywhere you go. It's everywhere. It's a city devoted to money. You know? So I wanted to su suggest that um, as a sort of backdrop, that money is, you know, Hong Kong is about money, uh, like New York is, like London is. Actually, maybe more than New York, even. I mean, I mean, Hong Kong is. Really, I mean, Hong Kong is. The funny thing is, Hong Kong is doesn't doesn't seem as materialistic as the United States. It's funny, it's, but it's but money is enormous. There's a very different attitude towards money here. I mean, money is very matter of fact here. It's like money, money, money. And you go to the casinos and you see, you know, <laughs> it's just extraordinary. You know, the money is this, is this fetish. You know, it's, it's very interesting. But I'm not Chinese, so it's not for me. I'm not. I'm like. I can't offer you. I don't. Off, I'm not offering insights about the Chinese relationship to money. You all know that relationship much better than me. I'm not trying to monopolize. Oh, you, there's a question. I was going to say, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to keep on asking because I got lots of questions. So put your hand up. Yes. Uh, just uh, an interesting question. I know that uh, you choose the number four uh, as a uh, convenience, so that's to put the title as a front page. Not me, nothing to do with me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no idea where they. Put I have no idea where they put the number four. It should be the number no, number eight or number nine, but I don't. I don't really know why. You have to see the back too. <laughs> What's on the back? Oh, number five. Oh, I see. Five and four, and nine. Uh, okay, Gao, that's uh, lucky. Okay, that's your back right. But yeah, I, I looked at that. I thought I didn't. Uh, you have to see both sides. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless there was some mystical Chinese relationship to number four, uh, I don't know about. Uh, bad, yeah, it's bad work. Bad, bad luck. It's bad luck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure the designer was that clever. I don't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> it's like be very smart. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But, but actually, there's a good, why. Why did you choose Baccarat as the of all the games? To oh, it's to by far the it's the most interesting game there. You know, I mean, there's, you can play you can play poker and there and all kinds of games and roulette games and so on. But they're not as interesting as the Baccarat games. The Baccarat tables, are the, are, that's where the action is in, in Macau. That's where the boards are. That's where the, the, the spirit of uh, the uh, forces of luck are most imminent. And the Baccarat tables are the ones where people gather. I don't know if any of you go to Macau to gamble, but you know. But that's where the table people go to the Baccarat tables to just feel that energy. And you know, and if a, a table gets lucky, you know, you get these great crowds uh, surround the tables. I don't think that happens with poker, does it? I mean, maybe it does. I don't think it's quite the same thing. I'm not allowed to go into this. I'm not, <laughs> not allowed to go into it. <laughs> quite right, too. Yeah. As I said, you always lose. You know. What, what is the, do you know the history of Baccarat? Is it's not is is not an Asian game? I don't know much about it. Yeah, it's, no, it's a it's a it's a game that became popular in Europe in the 17th 18th century. Punto Blanco became popular, and it became this sort of uh, the game of the aristocrats who used to like playing it. And of course, uh, as a result of that, it became James Bond's game. You remember the beginning of Casino Royale? 
the movie you probably saw, but the, the, the novel too, it just starts out with him playing Baccarat. You know? He's in a smoking jacket and, you know, it's like Baccarat. You know? It has this sort of, uh, has this aura about it. Um, it's a high stakes game in Europe. If you go if you go to Monte Carlo or something, you play Baccarat, you know. That's the aristocratic game. And it, of course in China it's been democratized in a, in a different way because it's Punto Blanco, which is a different kind of Baccarat, I'm not quite sure, but the, the kind of simplified Baccarat they play in Macau has no skill. It's just two cards, you know. There's no, you can't, you can't play a clever game. It's not like playing poker where you, you can have a little bit of skill. Baccarat, the, the form of Macau Baccarat, Punta Blanca, there's no skill at all. It's completely, and that's interesting because it means that people are just um, letting go of their ego in a way. They're just sort of allowing themselves to go in the flow. They're not thinking, they're not planning, they're not strategizing, they're just ch -ch 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 -ch. There's a kind of, there's something therapeutic about it, I think. It's very, very strange. And a strange game to play because you have no control. You just dung, dung, dung. It's like this very, it just goes along and, you know, and your money is going down the drain and it's, it's, it's an interesting feeling. We're all looking for the lucky player. Yeah, right. And they're all flocked to that lucky player. Yeah. And they'll follow him. That's why they like him. Exactly, exactly. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, the character in the book, that happens to him, and he gets this little retinue that follow him around, and he doesn't know why they're there, and he's like, go away. And they're like, no, you're lucky, you're lucky. We have to do what you do, you know. <laughs> but of course, the player who's lucky doesn't know either, since there's no skill involved. It's just Guan Yin or something. It's like something, some, you know, some supernatural force comes, and it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> it's very interesting to uh, watch it, though, if you go on a large background floor uh, and watch this kind of, it doesn't happen all the time, but when you see it happening, it's it's really interesting. And you get these very, uh, very boisterous crowds, people screaming, shouting, you know. Yeah, I think the moral, yeah, I think I, I do believe in uh, stories having a moral, you know, point. I don't think there's any, uh, and it's not interesting to me otherwise. I, mean, I think you're telling a morality fable. It's just me. I mean, I think that's, you're, making, you're trying to, so the premise is not just a cute idea for a story, it's also a moral uh, dilemma for a character. Um, and I couldn't imagine, I don't think I could really get through a book that, that where that wasn't the case. So in the case of uh, this book, it's about a guy who's stolen money and wants to, so this book about money, so what happens to the money that's stolen that then gets turned into a gambling fund and lost one, lost one. So there are, of course, um, somebody who is running away from, uh, what's the word for it, running away from his reckoning in a way, running away from a reckoning which should have happened a long time ago. And the choice is to, you know, to, to become invisible and to assume another identity in order to escape that reckoning. Of course, the reckoning always catches up with you, you know, as, it, as it does in life. You know. Yeah, well, I would say that places produce certain kinds of stories. Um, and you, like if this story couldn't happen in Edinburgh, if you, if you set this story in Edinburgh, it would be over in five minutes because the police would just arrive, you know. <laughs> it's like, uh, moral reckoning, mate, you're in the cop. You know? <laughs> End of story. <laughs> so there's no, nothing you can do with it. You have to set a story like that in a place where it can happen. Uh, like you could, that story I've just written is set in Phnom Penh. Well, you know, Phnom Penh is a very slippery place, full of slippery people. Slippery things can happen. And people can make choices and lead to other things, lead to other things. There's a certain kind of story that's realistic in Phnom Penh that is completely ridiculous in Brighton. It doesn't, it doesn't work. In Brighton, you could have a story about, I don't think you could even write Brighton Rock, Graham Greene's famous book about Brighton in the 1930s. You couldn't write that now. It wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't, it wouldn't. I think. I don't think it would happen. So places are also, uh, of course, determined by uh, political and social regimes and so on. Uh, so Macau is a place where people look the other way. You know, if you, you're a bit dodgy and you, and people just, they won't ask questions. 
casino towns are like that. They, they, they make their living out of not asking questions. So people are allowed to fall between the cracks. And that's very, inter that's very interesting. So it's my turn. Yes. Uh, not that? exactly a question, but then uh, some, something to share. Uh, there was some mentioning about uh, how uh, the or Orientals or Chinese treat the subject of ghosts. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to share with uh, Oh yeah, do, please. Everybody. I'm interested to hear. About uh, actually a story, surprisingly, by Edgar Allan Poe. Ah, uh, okay. It goes like that. Uh, this chap was sitting at the, his own patio, overlooking uh, passers-by, and then he suddenly had this crazy idea of following one of them. And then he followed this chap day and night into town hall, onto streetcars, and then this chap never sleep, never goes to the toilet, never needs to, to drain or eat. So this is like this. Because the Orientals treat the ghost like everybody else, they yeah. are among us. Yes. Like uh, yin and yang, like uh, darkness, darkness and, and light and so on. See, I, I find that just um, amazing. When I first moved, uh, lived in Bangkok in 2005, I lived in this, uh, I rented a house from uh, a member of the royal family who had this enormous mansion and she was like a spoiled rich girl. She had like five BMWs. She went to school in the United States, multi-billionaire, you know. And she had, uh, and it was really crazy. And she had this, you know, and I had a little house next to her house. And my house was made of glass. It was completely transparent. So everybody, and she had all this stuff on the, in the house from Isan, from the north of the country. And they were virtually illiterate, you know. And they were the cooks, the gardeners, you know, the people who did the grounds work and everything. And um, I would come home late every night and uh, I would ring the bell, but they couldn't hear me. So I would climb over the climb over the wall to get back in, totally drunk, you know, like drop on the other side. And uh, as I made my way across the lawn, there'd be these the, the grounds people just sleeping out in the open, and they'd wake up and they'd say, uh, "Oh, you're home at last." Um, so did you see um, did you see mom and pop? And I'd say, "No idea what you're talking about." <laughs> You know, go to sleep. And this would go on for months and months. And then my tie got a little better, so we'd be able to be, we, we, we could be, talk a bit more. And they were talking about mom and pop all the time. There was an old couple who would trim the mango tree and drink their tea under the tree at night. And I thought, this is like psychotic. You know, I have no idea. They have these ghosts, you know. But they were like, mom and pop, mom and pop. So uh, I came home drunk yet again uh, one night blasted my way through the door and walked across the lawn. And as I was going through the, across the lawn, and I was really, really drunk, I mean, I was really out of it, I looked over the mango tree and I saw an old lady and an old man <laughs> sitting under the tree. And I went home and I laid on my bed and I was like, no, you didn't see that, that's impossible. So I got up again immediately, I rushed outside, it was full moonlight, no one there. So I thought, thank God, you know. So I went back, laid on my bed and I was thinking, that's crazy. I couldn't really have seen them. That's not possible. But obviously, I went out again. They weren't there, so obviously, it, it doesn't exist. I fell asleep. Next morning, the maid came to, who was part of that crew, came around and she said, um, we were talking about it all night because we were watching you cross the lawn the first time. And you said, you went across the lawn and you stopped and you looked at the mango tree and we all knew that you could see them. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, isn't it? <laughs> and I went, yes, I saw them. Ah, and they all, they all they were incredibly gratified. I'd finally seen the light, you know. <laughs> no arguing with them. You know? <laughs> they were like, we're right, you're wrong. They're there. We can see mom and pop. Turns out the owner of the house, her mother, her uncle and aunt had owned the house in the 1940s. And in 1941, they both died of tuberculosis and uh, during the Japanese occupation. And the spirit house in the garden, at the end of the garden, had two little effigies of mom and pop, who were the owners, in these little figures. And uh, they were sitting inside the spirit house. And uh, they said, that's where they live, but they're still here. So not only was it real for them, by power of suggestion, it had become real for me as well. Yeah. It was one of the incidents that made me want to write a, a, a ghost story. You know.
But I know I know of Thai friends who we're walking home from a restaurant or something, and one of the small back streets, you know, with not not much lights. We're walking down the street, talking about this and that, and and we we've got to turn into a street to get home, you know. And they'll go, no, 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 we can't go down there. I'm like, why not? He goes, oh, no, 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 <laughs> pee, <laughs> and we'll have to go all the way around the whole way <laughs> because they saw something. There's something energy. There's a ghost there. You know, amazing. Tell me your ghost stories. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I'm American. We don't have them anymore. You don't have them. What? We don't have them either. No. Yeah. Well, used to. Agnostics. Well, um, in, it, you went back and forth to Macau many times. Yeah. In this, it, at what point does it all kind of click that you know when you have a story? Um, that's a good question because it took this. This this took a long time. I was right. I I started writing this book in two thousand and eight. Believe it or not, and um, I wrote it in, in uh, and it was terrible. It was like maybe it's still terrible. I wrote it and I just thought it just doesn't work. It just doesn't. I couldn't get it right, you know. So I abandoned it, let it go for a year, went back to it, wrote it again. It was still really bad. And these are 60,000 word, 70,000 word drafts. You know, it's like four months of work. It's ridiculous. Gone, you know. And then I wrote this other book, The Forgiven, which worked for the first draft. I wrote it in two months. And I didn't change anything, didn't change a word, didn't require any editing. So it's just the unconscious, it's just working. It has nothing to do with anything. And then I went back to this book afterwards, and it was much more difficult. Like I couldn't, that book came out, this book didn't come out. It just had to, it just, I don't know why. I really don't know why. But um, it was probably because I had a character, but I didn't quite know Macau as well. I, I lived in Morocco, so I knew it very well. Macau was just some place I had to get to know a bit more, so I started going back. And, and as I started doing that, things began to suggest themselves. I think books are really completely unconscious in the way they, they form. They form themselves inside you. They're not really... And then you execute what's that, what was there. But I... You know, I didn't really, or I couldn't really fabricate something rationally, you know. So it, so the book didn't didn't sort of arrive in one go? No, not at all. You didn't? No. At no. the sixth trip or no. something? I wrote, it in the, I wrote it in the third person, first of all. In the first oh, really? Place. Oh, yeah. Twice. It didn't work. Ridiculous amount of uh, labor to put into a, 60, a small book. <laughs> it's, like, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know why. It's just the way it is. Um, the, the you know the thing is that it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect. Otherwise, go away, do something else. And also, why waste the reader's time if it's if you haven't got it as perfect as you can make it? Then why ask somebody to read it? There's no there's no point. I'd rather read. I'd rather write three or four books and that's it. But each one is like you know. Can't make you can't make a living doing that. But any questions? I'm I'm a very regular sort of uh, you know I stay out very night late at night because I just my social life and Bangkok is like that um, and I get up very late and I work probably like two or three hours after that with no distractions and then it gets very hot, even though I have strong air conditioning it's very hot in Bangkok so I usually just the rest of the afternoon I just go go off and do other stuff and then I'll have dinner with friends. And then come home at ten o'clock and work until three in the morning. Do it five hours. And that five hour stretch is a thousand fifteen hundred words a day. You know, it's amazing how much someone once said if you wrote a thousand words for a year, your total output would exceed the collective works of Ian e. Forster. <laughs> Which is probably true, you know. It's just a crazy way to think of it. But to do a thousand words a day is uh seven days a week is just but now I think it's just internalized like a clock. I just, you know, I just do it without thinking, you know. And I love to work after dinner with friends where you've talked and you've, you're a bit stimulated. Uh, and then to go home and just, uh, and I often write outside. I have a balcony outside and just write outside. I have surrounded by jungle, basically. And I have all these wild peacocks screaming. It's really nice.
No, it doesn't inhibit anything. Well, I mean, you know, of course, drinking, <laughs> drinking is a, a big drinker, but um, I'm not really. I drink at around seven, six, seven, eight. You know, then you have, you know, and then that the alcohol is sort of in you. But three hours later, it's kind of calmed down a bit. And then, uh, you know, I think it's a little post. But the guy, guys who are like pounding it down as they're writing, I don't understand. I, Hemingway once said you should write sober. You know, which is very good advice. <laughs> Everything you write when you're drunk or you're tipsy, you read it the next day and you think there's a good few things in there, but wow, that's bad. And you throw it away. Stone cold sober. <laughs> Just the you just the rule, but to have no alcohol at all, no alcohol at all. You know, last night I had my first glass of wine in a week, about a week. Uh, I don't know why I was just, I was off drinking for a week, and I had a glass of wine last night in a in a tapas bar on Queens Road East, and I had a glass of Marcus de Murrieta, which is fantastic wine. I'm amazed to see it in Hong Kong. You know, it amazing. I had this glass of wine. I thought, God, I would love to just work now. You know, instead of which I'm in a bar. You know, <laughs> sort of a waste. You know. Red wine is the one exception, I think. Any other questions? Hello. It is uh, mentioned just now by one of the uh, participants uh, regarding your view on ghost. And how about your view on God? On God? <laughs> <sighs> mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, brought up a strict Catholic. So my... Mother was very religious, so I brought up with that, um, and you know, I mean, I grew up in a school where you had a religious service every morning, and da da da. It's very, um, but, and I don't have. I'm an atheist now, but I don't have any antipathy towards religion per se, for that reason. Maybe I don't know. I don't feel. I love going to churches. I love. I feel. I go, I, in fact, I think it's very important to go to churches. And, you know, one of the reasons I like Macau is it's full of churches. Beautiful churches, too. Um, but, you know, uh, I had this conversation a lot with my mother before she died, where she was very upset that, I, you know, she felt I had left the church and all that. Um, but the idea of, I mean, I prefer, I live in a Buddhist country by choice. I actually, it sounds silly, but. I actually like living in a Buddhist environment. I'm not a Buddhist, but Buddhism f seems to produce a more acceptable human uh, environment for me. Because the questions of monotheism, which percolate all the way down into all kinds of other things, uh, are sometimes very disturbing for me. I don't know, if I don't really, but the, the Buddhist sense is not deistic particularly, there isn't, there isn't, um, and I, if you have a relationship with a Buddhist, with a Buddhist person, um, it's not, one doesn't have conversations about God, whereas with a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, you have conversations about God all the time, and that's a very difficult conversation to have. I, I'm actually an atheist, but I'm not um, an, a dogmatic one, and I don't think atheism uh, should be a creed that we go around trying to convert other people. I think that's a mistake. There's Richard Dawkins, you know. I don't. I think that's uh, ridiculous. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Does anyone have a question? Um, every writer has some kind of um, inspiration. Well, actually, every artist action. But um, so, what was the source of your inspiration? For 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 this um, for for this work and other works, like, your do you have any personal experience that inspired this? No, I don't think I have. Um, that's a really tricky question to answer because what is inspiration? I think books, as Nabokov once said, begin with a pulse, with a little emotional moment. Uh, so it's a very tricky question to answer. And I don't believe in this people who think they're inspired by something concrete. I don't think that it works like that. I think in, I think it's a very quiet, uh, mysterious pulse. It's like an emotion you feel or something. I don't know what it is. It can be, and it can come from anything. Um, I think for this book, this book, 
uh, it was a guy I met in Phnom Penh. It was a character, his face. I went into a bar called the Hope and Anchor, and I met this guy at the bar. He was like a sort of a craggy old English guy. You know, and I could tell straight away his name was fake, it wasn't his name. And I looked down at his shoes, and he was wearing these amazing pair of like uh, suede brogues with no socks. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's really strange, and uh, it's creepy, you know. <laughs> but I looked at his face, and there was just something that was kind of like, um, it was the beginning of this idea of this character who was lost in, and was, you know, had reinvented himself. So that was, if there's an inspiration. But that to me wasn't, it wasn't that I looked at him and I thought, ah, oh, that's an interesting character, quote unquote. No, 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 it was just an emotion. It was just, I felt, I felt tremendous pity for him, I suppose. There was something in him that moved me. I don't know, I don't know what it was. I guess the feeling of lostness, it was a lost soul, you know. But lost soul, but also a dandy. I found that quite, um, you know, something about that. It was, yeah, you know, he bothered to put on nice shoes, <laughs> even though he didn't have a life. You know, this is a guy with, uh, you know, and his name he called himself Tom Jones or something. It was ridiculous. You know, <laughs> it's like Tom Jones is a famous singer. <laughs> it's not your name. <laughs> <laughs> and I could tell he was a fraud, you know, he was a guy who'd run away from his wife to not pay alimony or something, you know. Um, but I found that humanly, you know, uh, it was touching in some way. So that's an inspiration, if you like. Um, so you're saying that an inspiration is more like an, an everyday deep, thing. deep emotion, a, a deep hunch. I don't think it, yeah, or maybe not deep, or something... You know, it's like these strange. We, don't you, I think every human being has those moments when you're sort of caught in the crosshairs of some circumstance. You know, like you're taking a boat across the bay or something. You have that moment when you have a kaleidoscope of feelings for no reason. It just comes out of nowhere. You don't know what it is. It's a question of memories or something that, you know, something comes together. I think every human being has that feeling. I don't think it's unique to people who act on it in terms of writers and artists. I think all human beings have those feelings. Yeah, but obviously it's deeper than simple interest. No, it's not simple interest. Because simple interest is intellectual or sexual. But that's not interesting really, is it? Because sexual interest is instrumental and intellectual interest in a way is as well. So yes, it has to, if it's not enigmatic, if it's not mysterious to yourself, then it won't be mysterious to anybody else. It has to be mysterious to yourself. Yeah. When you go to Macau, do you gamble? And if you do, which games do you play? I'm not a gambler, no. I'm not a gambler. I can't. I've played, I have played Baccarat or tried to. Uh, very, um, you know, but I've, I'm, I wouldn't dare go near poker. I wouldn't be good enough to do it, you know. And I know gamblers. I know guys who do it, you know, they really know their stuff, you know. Um, it's extraordinary what, you, what they know, you know. Um, I, d I dare not. I dare not. I dare not partake, you know. Uh, the times where I've played Baccarat, I've lost money, you know. And I got, eventually got talked out of it by various concerned girlfriends who said, you know, she really spend the money on me, not on. <laughs> so I stopped, to answer your question, like, like I'm a recovered alcoholic, I just stopped, you know, I stopped playing, you know. How about you, do you play that? It's amusing, it's fun, it's great. I actually enjoy it a lot. I might go tomorrow, actually, <laughs> have a look. Anyone who's going to ask a question? So God, do you have anything to follow up? Uh, one more. Yeah. Um, if you were to recommend other authors or other books, not, not ones that, that you might recommend, but, but ones that other people could read that might help them understand your book better. Because ah, there's sort of a tradition of books like this, isn't there? Yeah, and they wouldn't be books about particular places. Um, I would say, ooh, Graham Greene, The Quiet American, I would say is a book that's close to my heart. I would say The Sheltering Sky, Paul Bowles, close to my heart. Um, I would say Handful of Dust, even more, even more, close to my heart. I think those three would be high up there. Um, and Bowles also wrote a collection of stories called The Delicate Prey, which is very, very, uh, which I think is amazing. How much longer do you think that the book about the Westerner in East Asia can continue to be written? 
I think it's more or less not being written that much now. I might, I think it's died out in a way. Um, but that's maybe because the conceits underlying it previously don't work anymore. Um, you know, we were talking about, about Jan Morris, I mean, the British writer who wrote that book on Hong Kong. Um, and I think that kind of book is not going to be written now. I, I read it recently, and it just it just seemed um, it's you know it's quite a lovely book actually. And she's very talented, very brilliant. But um, you know, it's clear that, it, that there's something viscerally missing there. It's not. It's 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 from on high in a way. It's just, it's a sort of it's it's um it's like the idea of the sort of colonial adventurer coming here and explaining. I, I think that obviously has disappeared. You know, I mean, anyone who's writing about these mega cities in Asia has to be here and has to be on the ground. You have to you have to, you have to feel it in a different way, and that's not easy to do because uh, you have to live here. It's as simple as that. I don't think you can come here for two weeks and then write a book. It's just not. Uh, I think that can see as well. Most Western writers, if not all Western writers, live in the West. They don't. They don't. They don't go anywhere. They go on little junkets and they travel. Blah blah blah. But they don't live in other places. Um, so I think maybe. I mean, some do. There are a few who live there. Uh, I feel living in Bangkok. I'm a bit of an anomaly. I mean, I don't really know any other writers who live there. I mean, there are thriller writers, but I don't know anybody else. Literary writers. I don't. You know, um, all the writers I know in the literary world, they all live in New York, in London, or France. That's it. And that's it. Yeah. And that's what they write about. Yeah. R uh, understandably so, and rightly so. Um, but it's in a way a kind of, it's a shame. I think there's, this part of the world is changing faster than any other part of the world. Uh, the cities here are changing faster than any other part of the world. And the cities here are the most interesting in the world right now. Uh, not just because they're the most dynamic and they're the most inventive, but also uh, just because of their huge size, their their, un, their unpredictable growth. Uh, I, I feel that Bangkok is an extraordinarily interesting city to live in, extraordinarily interesting city to write about, and nobody's writing about it. It's just um, you know, you have these sort of aging thriller writers who are writing about bar girls, you know, and blah blah blah, and it's just not not of any interest to me at all. But the actual city, the real city, is completely uh, uncharted territory, you know. But the reason why it's um, it's hard to do, you know, you you actually have to. It's hard to actually come to grips with a, an environment that is not yours. Yeah. There's a I was, there's a feeling about the character in the book, and in fact the ghost story, uh, that makes it feel like the end of something. The end it's, of a period. The it's end the of end of the colonial period, the, the colonial, the post-colonial um, period. And yet, uh, here's the proviso to that, the, the condition to that, which is that um, the book, I'm, I'm writing a book, a new novel now about Bangkok, which is about what's going on in Bangkok, which is the whole sort of uh, military dictatorship and the takeover and the revolution and all that. And my heroes in that book are a bunch of journalists. And w journalists uh, are the last, in my opinion, the last colonial, in a way, in a, inadvertently, because they're all leftists and liberals, but they are, in fact, the last colonial class of people. And if you look at the way Asia is represented by Western journalists, I mean, it's extremely... It's amazing to behold it, really. I mean, and I know a lot of these people. They, they, it's not that they're not uh, sincere or uh, decent or blah, blah, blah. They, they, they're, they're all nice people and all that. But what they write about is very, the way they see it is very particular. And they think of themselves as the incarnations of progress and enlightenment and so on. And, um, you know, everything they describe in the ground here has to be filtered through that. And it's not even conscious. It's a sort of, so they are very much like colonial officials who are kind of essentially reinterpreting conditions on the ground for an audience a long way away. You may have followed, I don't know if any of you have followed, in, uh, in Cambodia, for example, there's a, you know, a famous journalist called Nicholas Kristof who writes for the New York Times. And he's been writing about sexual trafficking and slavery for years and so on. And, and he's a huge, huge reputation in the United States. Great friends with Mia Farrow and you know Hollywood celebrities and so on. And he, over the years, he managed to cre created this sort of narrative, this picture of Cambodia and of what goes on there, which had became the official narrative of the country in a way, uh, because he's one of the most powerful people in the media in the West. Uh, okay, so last 
well, two, two months ago, a lot of his stories were found to have been fabricated. That he not he, did he misunderstand what was going on on the ground in Phnom Penh, which people in Phnom Penh, of course, have been saying for years. And people just roll their eyes. You even mentioned him. He's a guy who lives in a five-star hotel and has these girls traffic, you know, trafficked into the lobby to interview them. And he didn't understand their stories at all. What, one example, he, uh, gave a, he told the story of a girl who had lost her left eye in a brothel. Apparently the mama son had beaten her so badly that she lost her left eye when she was 13 years old. And he gave her name in the piece and said, this is the girl and this is her story, this is what goes on, blah, blah, blah. You have no idea how backward and primitive and horrifying Cambodia really is. And I know because I spent so much time, blah, blah, blah. The girl grew up, read her name, <laughs> online in the New York Times website and, and, sort of, and said, uh, wait a minute, that's me. Um, and she went to the Washington Post and she said, if you'd like, uh, send somebody here and I'll, I'll tell you what really happened. And she said, I lost my eye during an operation for a tumor when I was 13 and the surgeon who operated on me uh, kept a photographic re uh, r record of this in the hospital. And she took him to the hospital. The surgeon was like, yeah, I have the, he showed the reporter the fact that she had an eye operation. So here you have a narrative being formed by a powerful, charismatic, white savior journalist, which is entirely invented from top to bottom. It's a complete lie, you know. Uh, Christoph never apologized. He was, he was like, oh, well, these Cambodians are very unreliable. They lied to me. I was duped, you know. Um, and everyone accepts this as being a sort of, uh, that is a colonial relationship, I'm sorry. Um, it's absolutely disgusting. And disgusting, it's extraordinary that this, is, this still goes on, you know. Um, but if you go to a dinner party in London and New York and you talk about this issue, uh, people go crazy. If you, if you say no, it's actually more complicated than that. It's not, you don't understand what's going on in these cultures. You don't understand anything. Just because you're an NGO or a journalist, you, you are getting money from this, it's uh, business. You're getting donations, you're, f you're feeding into an audience. So that still tr is true in Asia. And I don't know why Asians tolerate it, I really don't. <laughs> I don't understand. Now they're beginning not to. And in Cambodia, we're seeing a counter reaction and people are saying, uh, no, this is bullshit, this stuff. We are not your victims. You know, we, we, can, we're not, we have our own stories, it's not, not what you think it is. And now they have increasingly the means to tell it. So you see, this is the colonial accounting of places um, has that problem in it, you know, that you you have somebody coming down, from, not just from a different place, but coming down from a higher, a higher position of power, you know. And that's not true anymore. Personally, I think that's a good thing. I don't want to do that. Um, and I find that way of looking at things uh, not really that interesting to me. But maybe I'm guilty of it too, I don't know. Um, have you considered the, your readership, or I mean, when you write, you write maybe out of your own experience as a foreigner living in Asian cultures? Have you, you want to do something about it, or you have you consider the Asian point of view? Well, or I you just simply, you know, just a foreigner. You write what you, what's on your mind. Yeah, I don't think it's like I think everywhere in the world people are doing this. Like, for example, if you look at the literature being produced in London and New York, a lot of it is produced by Indians, by Pakistanis, by Arabs, by, and by uh, I mean. Uh, this book got a very interesting review from a guy called Tash Orr, who's a, a Malaysian novelist living in London. He's actually from Singapore. He grew up in Taiwan. He now lives in London. He gave, he gave an interesting review. Um, so I think this sort of literature that is, uh, you know, a mixed, mixed literature is very common now around the world. Um, it's just that, uh, and, but in, in my books, the two books that I've done, I tr always try to create characters that are not Western. Now, I don't know whether I'm succeeding in that. I don't know. It's very hard to say if I've succeeded. I have a Chinese character in this book. You know, I try to imagine what a Chinese, a mainland Chinese girl working in Macau, I try to reconstruct her history and go back to where she came from in mainland China. Um, 
who knows how much I'm getting right, how much I'm getting wrong, you know. But then I would make the argument for trying to imagine, trying to imagine what somebody from a different, I think that's actually a good thing to try and do. I don't, if it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't think it's a big deal, you know. But to try, to try to make, because that's, a, that's an act of empathy, ultimately. You're trying to, you know, see how... I think it's important to do that. There are a lot of people who criticize that and say that it's not authentic or it's not, it's orientalist or blah, 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 you know. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a dated criticism. I don't think... We're not living in that kind of world now. The cultures that we all belong to are very close together now. They're very close. They're not that far away, you know. And there's another issue, which is that human beings aren't that... You know, not that, uh, that different in many ways. They're just not. You know, they're culturally specific, of course they are. And when I said that journalists don't understand Cambodia, of course that's true. But in terms of fiction, you're, you're creating characters, um, then I think I see no reason why an Indian writer should not invent an American character, or a Brazilian writer should not invent a Japanese character, or a Japanese writer should not invent a Scottish character. I, I see no reason why not. The motives that drive people are always the same. The biology of people is the same. Uh, the instincts are the same. The drives are the same. The, 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 the virtues and the sins are the same. And these are the things that make characters tick in your stories. You know, to, to, to give some special or uh, extra favor to your characters that you can... I don't know if it's um I think for me m m more important is just the if there's going to be authenticity it should be just in the story itself um, I don't think uh, I'm giving insights to people about different cultures, if that's what you're asking. No, I don't think so. I don't think in this book that I'm telling Western people about Moroccan culture. Absolutely not. No. I don't know anything about Moroccan culture. I know something, but not, you know, I, I, no, absolutely not. That's ridiculous, you know. But if you go to, if Westerners go to Morocco and they interact, which they do, then there's mutual imagining going on. Uh, and I don't think it's the place of novels to provide social knowledge. I don't think that's. I don't think we go to novels for that. I mean, some people would make the argument that they do, but I don't read books for that reason. I don't think so. Any more questions from the floor? Hey, Philip. I get the last word. The last word is. Um, I think this is a really good book. I, I I run the Asian Review of Books. I read books all the time. And this really is, I think, one of the best books set in this part of the world that I've read in years and years and years. So I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, and as I say, it, it draws a lot from, from local culture and some local literary traditions. And if you don't like it, you can go to Amazon and be there. <laughs> and can play. This guy knows nothing about China. Right. Nothing. Um, but as I say, I, I, think, I think it's a really, really nice book, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it, and I recommend it very highly. And I think it's also going to be a stage play here, looks like. Is that right? Yeah. Is that, that's confirmed? Pretty much. All right, so then, but read the book first. Don't wait for the play. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you. And thank you for asking so many interesting questions. That was great. Okay. Thank you, Lawrence and Peter, for the inspiring sharing. And then uh, let's give a big hand to our speakers today.